So hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to answer that question in a second. So I am Kelly. This is Uncorked History. Uh, I am, as usual, frazzled running to you from, I don't know, I was at work and dinner. And Anyway, I am thrilled to be here, and uh, I'm thrilled to be with Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Hi. I feel you on the frazzled part. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've kind of been all over the place. Um, yes. Tonight, we have two <laughs> very special guests. Uh, I'm very excited to talk with both of them. Um, so I'm going to introduce both of them, and then we'll jump into some questions. So uh, first, we have Dan Malik uh, with a C, which I got wrong earlier. Um, he is a medical historian specializing in alcohol and drug policy. He is also the director of the Center for Canadian Studies at Brock University uh, in Ontario. He runs a website called DrugHistoryCanada.com, and he is also the author editor of many books, uh, including one that I thought was relevant to tonight, which is Try to Control Yourself, the Regulation of Public <laughs> Drinking in Post-Prohibition, Ontario, 1927 to 1944. So welcome, Dan. Thank you. Quite great to be here. Awesome. Uh, and then we have uh, Jason Lancer. He is a native Hoosier. Did I say that right? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, and he earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD all from Indiana University, which is pretty awesome. He is the assistant director of the Butler University Honors Program, and his research centers on the intersection of religion, politics, and law in American history. Uh, he is the author also of many books, uh, <laughs> including two dealing with prohibition, which are relevant to tonight. Um, so we'll link to some of their books in our show notes on YouTube. I feel like I haven't written enough books here. I haven't written any book. Well, I haven't published any books, I should say. I only got <laughs> I'm one. Feeling a little overwhelmed. <laughs> you have a bookazine too, Jamie. Oh, fair. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's talk about what everyone's drinking. And since we have some people talking prohibition, I went with a French 75, which I'm not sure I mixed correctly. Uh, but it has gin and uh, simple syrup and lemon juice and champagne. I love the French 75 because it's named, well, it's allegedly named after a, a French gun. <laughs> so I always found that one fun. I am drinking a Prohibition era cocktail as well. I did not have a coupe glass, unfortunately. So I just decided to make a very large version of the <laughs> Mary Pickford uh, named for the 1920 starlet. Allegedly, it was uh, made by a bartender in Havana when uh, Mary Pickford was visiting and it is one part light rum, one part pineapple juice, and some grenadine to turn it pink. Uh, so fun story about Mary Pickford. She used to knit during World War I, knit for the soldiers. Very nice. Uh, I know this because I am obsessed with uh, <laughs> the, the knitting brigades of World War I. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Jason, Dan, are you guys drinking? Yes. <laughs> what are you drinking? <laughs> uh, well, well, in, in honor ahead, of uh, Lucy Hayes, our our first um, lady, our former first lady and first uh, college graduate, uh, female college graduate who was first lady, I'm drinking lemonade. I will save some harder stuff until afterwards because I didn't know what you know necessarily would come out of my mouth if I was drinking. <laughs> yeah. It's fair. <laughs> it's fair. I'm uh, I'm drinking a a beer from uh, a local ish craft brewery called uh, Collective Arts, and they do a lot of they support the artists as well. So all the cans have different artwork on them and all that stuff. It's just a great beer called uh, Ransack the Universe. I could have gone the cocktail route, but I probably would have drunk it way too fast. So <laughs> fizzy helps in this respect. <laughs> and, and tell us what's behind you there, Dan. Is that your your personal bar? Yeah, that's well, that's part of it. I have this bad, good habit of collecting stuff. So um, there's another one upstairs. <laughs> this is my <laughs> this is my display, but the other one's in a cabinet, and I display it when I need access to it. And yeah, so that's that there. I'm going to have to point this out to my husband when he says that I have too many bottles of wine. I'm going to be like, well, I don't have a whole bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh -huh. All right. So I will start us off if that's okay. Uh, I have so many questions. <laughs> um, so 
Prohibition is very interesting to me, uh, being that it is uh, only the only constitutional amendment that has ever been enacted to repeal another one in America. Um, so the 21st in 1933 repealed the 18th from 1919. Um, so why, for, for both of you, whoever wants to start, why did we go the prohibition route? Um, why did we allow the, the governments to take control over intoxicants like alcohol in such a rigid and strict way? I'll let Jason start with that one. It sounds like uh, <laughs> prohibition and the law and religion is where it goes. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that the first thing to keep in mind is that it is not something that happens overnight. Um, it is a, a process that spans at least the better part of a century of, of agitation and discussion, uh, debate, um, and that you've got one, and I'll speak mostly to the United States here, at least for right now, uh, a, both a real and a perceived um, problem of drinking. Americans were drinking a lot. Um, and in part, that was a, a, a lack of you know, refrigeration, obviously, right? We're talking about the 19th century and, and, and people, Euro-Americans pushing west and westward expansion and, you know, the frontier. And um, there was also a belief, is, in, that part, right, then comes into play. Things like milk, like my that my 14-year-old son still drinks to abandon. And we think that could be a problem if he ever switches uh, his, his beverage of choice. How do you keep milk fresh and cold and uh, and then you you know get the horror stories like what happened to Abraham Lincoln's family with the milk sickness and um, so there's not a lot of trust in that water yes but um, you know even then you you've got the an issue of pollution especially as we get into to some areas and later on in the century uh, alcohols is a good choice but people are drinking a lot of it and there is very early on a recognition that that um, leads to problems. Um, there's also a recognition that of, of two things over the course of the 19th century that lead to prohibition. The first I would say is the notion that the personal pledges, and there are, are a lot of pledge movements where you are going to pledge that you will no longer drink. Um, and this is especially true for young men the pledge movements don't last. Um, you might really believe it tonight and tomorrow you might find yourself drinking again. The I've other thing, that that. Happens, <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing I think that, that happens is this notion, especially the development of, especially as we get into urban areas, that alcohol is a big business. And as a business, whether it's your local saloon or the brewery or wherever, they're out to make money. And um, so even what might be considered, especially at the time, rather easy laws to follow, um, those both at the small and the big business end of the alcohol industry don't care and they will disregard those laws. And so it becomes this sort of, of ratchetization of, look, we tried it, on our personal level, it didn't work. We tried these rather minor things. I mean, it's hard for, I think, a lot of Americans to believe that it's really been within at least my lifetime, and I won't date myself too much there, but that things were really opened up on Sundays. Um, I can remember, you know, things, oh, Sunday afternoon until anything opened. Um, but Sunday closing laws, like just one day, <laughs> right? No alcohol. So, nah, nah, we'll figure out some way to get around that. Um, to local option, to things like countywide option, then state, and then finally it was, well, then we've just got to outlaw the entire thing. So, Dan, did that, did it follow a similar kind of pattern in Canada? I know that there was some prohibition, you know, was that the full country? Was it similar time? Yeah, our, um, uh, constitutionally, prohibition could not be a national, well, okay. 
So it, it was a long, complicated process as well. And um, a lot of the same factors came into it that Jason uh, mentioned. Uh, because of our legal system and our constitutional um, arrangement being a little different, um, there's more power. There was supposed to be more power in the federal government. And in fact, liquor laws and debates over federal, what was called the dominion and uh, provincial rights was kind of the booze issue fundamentally affected our constitutional relationships because we, the first law that our Supreme Court heard was about brewers not wanting to take out a provincial license because they had a dominion license already and on and on. So to figure out who had right over this. So the provinces by the 1890s, they determined the provinces had the right to um, ban completely the sale of liquor, but not the manufacturer. That was a federal thing. Um, so we did have prohibition during the First World War, uh, national prohibition briefly during wartime measures. So they did stop for a few months, really started the vote in 1917. Um, and, and we were at war from 1914 to 1918, right? So um, stopped the manufacture and the sale and redirected manufacture into um, military purposes because both medicinal and some armaments use alcohol. Um, but then the provinces, each province or most provinces had tried some form of local option, which is usually by the 1870s, a county or city thing. So the maritime, a lot of the maritime provinces had almost complete prohibition and the other provinces experimented with it. Politicians didn't want it. We don't have con we don't have provincial constitutions like you have state constitutions, which was one of the ways in the states that some states went uh, had prohibition uh, initially. So, uh, and our prohibition was never a constitutional amendment. Um, it was a federal wartime law that was supposed to end after one year after the war, and then the provinces. It basically said provinces pass prohibition, and or you know most of them have by then. And then after one year, most of the provinces considered it. And in fact, Quebec said, no, they never really were into it. And then it rolled from West to East, so uh, from British Columbia on. Uh, so we did, yes, we did have a prohibition, but it was, except for that brief time during the war, it was never a, the sort of complete prohibition that you had in the States where manufacturing was ended, which enriched a few uh, dist uh, distillers and brewers who managed to send their stuff to the US. I don't know how that happened. Um, yeah, so long answer to your question, sorry. I think it's so interesting, the difference in prohibition between the US and Canada. Um, you know, thinking about how, uh, when I was looking at prohibition in Canada, uh, as you mentioned, using the provinces, um, most of the provinces, it said, had ended their prohibition laws in the 1920s, and yet America sort of starts their prohibition in the 1920s. So it's kind of an interesting progression um, down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's uh, the, that book that you guys mentioned that I wrote was just started with the question of what happened in, in Ontario, which is bordered by Michigan and New York State for the most part, and, and then up in the West, which isn't very populous. It, um, that's Michigan as well, isn't it? Anyway, sorry, my geography. Um, I'm a historian. So uh, what happened in Ontario when prohibition continued in the States, but it ended in Ontario in 1927. And so from 27 to 33, there was this really interesting relationship like July 1st, which is our national holiday, was on a Friday and July 4th was on a Monday. And of course, if you live in a border town, as I do, you know, that's just a recipe for fun or chaos, depending on your perspective. And our prohibition had ended a month before July 1st, 1927. So it was a, 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 the Windsor area, Windsor, Detroit area was just crazy. Um, so yeah, so that, that was a really interesting period. But then in 1933, at the end of 1933, when suddenly across the border, the laws were more liberal with, turn, with, with regards to liquor, that's when our provincial government added, because it was only about sale from 27 to 34. 1934, they added public um, drinking. So you could go into a, a hotel beverage room and drink. And that was in some ways directly response to what happened across the border. Suddenly the flow was moving in the other direction. So I think one of the questions for me uh, about prohibition, and of course it ended, right? And it was repealed in the US and, you know, is, does it work? Did it work? You know, what, what effect did it have? Uh, and, you know, to, uh, did it have the effect that the people who wanted the laws hoped that it would have? 
Well, there's a great question full of debate and <clears throat> uh, so, you know, I think um, in the U.S. the the general assumption was that there is n there was no doubt, and I think this is is a consensus viewpoint. There is no doubt that it cut alcohol consumption. Um, how much I think is open to debate, and also depends on what year you're looking at, and frankly, where you're looking at as well. Um, nationally, most drives would have argued by the mid to late 1920s that alcohol consumption was down somewhere in the neighborhood of 80%. Um, might be a little high. Um, but they would also point out some other things that were going on with that, that yes, some people were still drinking, but they, they tended to argue that it was, if you think 80% aren't, it's the top 10%. And the bottom 10 percent um but even the bottom 10 percent that's a there's a question there because you've got to ask what are they drinking and where are they getting it from and you know a, a lot of that good canadian alcohol that somehow ended up uh, in the united states is a great example that stuff isn't coming cheap all right. If you if you go to some place like Chicago and you frequent a, a, an establishment that's perhaps run by Al Capone, um, they're not just handing that away to you. You're you're paying a price. Um, and if you are living outside of an urban area, right? You have to, the transportation cost. How are you getting there? And then, you know, and we we'll I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more, but. Um, you know, the discussion of what is being made uh, that's illegal. Um, that varies in a lot of quantities and uh, in quality, quite frankly. And, you know, I, we had a, a fun back and forth with somebody, I'm not sure if she's on here tonight, on Twitter this week about bathtub gin and whether or not you should drink bathtub gin. Um, that stuff can kill you uh, if it's not done right. Um, and, and so even in a place like Indiana where you know you might be surrounded by cornfields, yeah, you can take corn and you can make that into moonshine. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's very good moonshine um, or that you're going to get a lot of repeat customers. Um, so I, you know there's a, a lot of I think false starts um, on that front, but also at the end of the day, there's no doubt that it's not as successful as Dries had hoped, but there's also uh, a lot more to it than and in terms of, of enforcement and people not drinking or drinking much less than they were um, than wets like to make out. The, the fact of the matter is everybody's not drinking during prohibition, um, despite what wet propaganda is maybe saying by the end of it. Yeah. it's. It's one of the, one of those really interesting questions because we think about the dries and the wets as if there's only two parties involved, like the dries and the wets, and yet there was a huge group of what are what variously were called moderationists, or sometimes they called themselves the tr the true temperance people who looked at tempering your behavior instead of completely cutting it off. So, um, and I think this would probably hold true for the U.S. as well. Um, there there are two historians who have argued in art fairly pivotal articles, I think. One was my, my master supervisor, Jack Blocker, and another one was um, John Burnham, who said prohibition worked, right? Because they look at the numbers of uh, the, the, the amount of drinking that went down and, and all of that stuff. And, you know, Jack Blocker is a good friend and a wonderful guy. And with all respect to both of them, they're wrong. And they're wrong because that was not what the prohibitionists were out for. For decades, the response to prohibitionism was, moderationism, like, well, we'll cut it down, we'll license it, we'll, we'll cut down the number of ta taverns, we'll increase the taxes or, or whatever, right? And, and they said, no, we want the total suppression of the liquor traffic, right? It was our national organization was the Dominion Alliance for the total suppression. Uh, the UK had one of those as well. So it wasn't just the, yeah, we'll kind of back off a bit and let the drinkers have a bit. That wasn't that national uh, organization. So prohibition failed because it ended and notwithstanding, now that that not to say, you know, so if we take the prohibitionists that they say, no, it, it failed. It, they, 
and, and yet from our moderationist perhaps perspective and certainly a early 20, 21st, late 20th century perspective, we were just getting in some estimations back to the kind of level of drinking that was happening before prohibition. Um, but from this perspective, uh, it seems it certainly changed things. Um, not to mention what also changed things was decades of prohibitionist um, lobbying or agitation that changed local laws and tightened licensing laws and things like that. So by the time prohibition came, people had re sort of redirected their drinking into things like loggers and pilsners, which was helped by things like refrigeration and tended to drink less. And uh, an in interesting thing we um, between our two countries was Canadians kept looking to the States saying, you know, we've got to be more like them. Right? And, and, and there were two sort of pressures. There was a British, British tradition and, and the American sort of a Republican tradition, um, smaller Republican. And, um, and yet the moderationists kept saying, we drink way less than Americans do already. Why are we looking over there? <laughs> their laws or their attempts aren't working. So it's a really interesting kind of tension in that respect. But, but the, to answer the original question from the prohibition, if you ask, if you look through the prohibitionist eyes, prohibition absolutely didn't work because it ended. Right. So um, thinking about people drinking excessively, um, why do you think alcohol captures people's imagination and typically features pretty prominently, at least often in pop culture? I'm thinking of shows like Mad Men where they have bars in their offices and Sex in the City, the women have the Cosmopolitan and later the Manhattan, like they have a thing. Um, why, why does alcohol compared to other types of intoxicants, um, why do you think it features so prominently? Uh, um, if I could, I could start for a chance. Yeah, start right to, give, give you a chance to think <laughs> for a second, Jason. Um, I, that's a really good question. I think, um, I think this is, that question sort of connects to what I think is the reason prohibition never worked, which was alcohol has a lot of cultural symbolism, right? And so you get together with friends and drink, whether it was in an eight, a tavern in the 1870s where workers got together and they learned about new jobs or supported each other or whatever, or you get together in the afternoon for or the morning for mimosas or cosmos or whatever they did on Sex in the City, right? So there was that aspect. So in Mad Men or these other representations of the 50s, 60s, and early 70s and into the late 70s, that was kind of, whether it happened as much, I don't know, but that was representative of that kind of relaxed social environment that I think they were also. Now, I'm not a I'm not a cultural studies scholar, cultural historian, but that that I think was a big part of it. That it it, it persisted and it was people liked it, right? And that's and, and there's as much as we hear things about all of the so-called bad um, the the health dangers of of alcohol. There's also a lot of social benefits to it that that are sort of glossed over. So we're often surprised. Why did it persist, or why did that happen? You know, well, because it was actually quite enjoyable. Most people didn't do it to excess. Most people didn't have a problem with it. And but now, when we look back um, to a time like the '60s, I think it's also representing that kind of alienness and, and excess, along with the way the men treated the women and the women accepted it or whatever. So, yeah, I, I think Dan's right. I mean, there's a there's this a very strong part of of drinking is that as a social lubricant, if you will, it's a, a means to get people to relax, um, to talk, to enjoy, to maybe you know forget about their day a little bit. Um, you could break into the Cheers theme song for those mm -hmm. people who remember Cheers. Um, Right, there's definitely that. And and there's also, I think, with um, any sort of Hollywood representation, it's an easy thing um, to do. It's also yeah. something that is, there's um, a social acceptance now to you know, I, obviously, if you if you made a film uh, or a show, if there had been television in the twenties, right, of Mad Men, well, the, those guys would have been bad people because they're drinking, because that, that's the way it would have went down. But um, 
but you know the alcohol and we could talk about something else which is related in the minds of a lot of reformers tobacco and this is maybe an interesting twist right uh both of those were widely accepted and they were okay and that they still you know up until fairly recently both of them were seen as okay things to do and often things that went together um and so if you're you're looking for that well that's better than showing heroin um you know somebody shooting up heroin or doing cocaine those are right those are those are that's bad and so we can see that as bad and there's it's harder to spin that into that's just some you know friends hanging out after a hard day at the office talking about what's going on yeah yeah and i'm sure some of our colleagues have written stuff about the the, the span like you can see on a show the range of potential dangers in something like alcohol, right? Um, so you would have maybe social drinking in one end and then the, the, you know, the, an alcoholic at the other end or someone dying from alcohol poisoning or something like that. And it, it does, it, it's a very powerful tool, a, a very, very powerful narrative tool to use as well as being something many people are familiar with. And that has a lot of um, meaning behind it, right? Has that embedded danger and socializing thing together, right? Yeah. Here we are. <laughs> you know, in recent years, we've seen uh, the, at least in the, the US, I'm sure it's similar in Canada, the sort of popularization of marijuana and mm -hmm. greater acceptance of it, you know, more places legalizing it, seeing more as, you know, sort of a social drug like alcohol. You know, do you see anything in that, you know, as you're looking at the acceptance of alcohol or not acceptance over the years, you know, how how we can view the the current rise of popularity of marijuana? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'll start because I was involved in a lot of this from about 2015 when our, our prime minister did was elected and said he would legalize cannabis until 2017 when it was and on i saw so many parallels in the rhetoric around the end of prohibition right because my my that one book was about re-establishing some kind of licensing regime and we saw the same sorts of things municipalities saying we're not going to do it i was like oh hey that's local option and um and and whether it will be a provincial system or a more open market system would, would represent different aspects of the country, but also represented some of the arguments about the, the state's role and is it immoral for the state to be involved in this problematic traffic and to get money from it, which is just we heard that same sort of thing uh, in the in the in the liquor debates, right? So so there absolutely were a lot of things. But what was also interesting about cannabis, at least in Canada, was it has, and I think in the States, I'm thinking of some of the States, it has the, the dual nature of alcohol of, as an intoxicant, but of tobacco as something that is smoked in public and therefore perceived to be dangerous just through its smoked nature, right? So you're, or can you have uh, non-smoking or can you have cannabis smoking in public spaces whereas in Ontario you don't have that with tobacco smoking in that so it's it's delivery most popular delivery system sort of touched on a lot of the issues of tobacco and it's intoxicating nature touched on issues relating to alcohol and I saw that a lot in the regulatory arguments yeah I mean I, I think Dan's right on there and it, it's been very interesting to watch as uh, Indiana has, has not legalized uh, marijuana at all but uh, you know other states close to us Michigan for example has has done some things and and the, the regulatory debates Ohio was debating it I don't think they passed it but they, they debated um, and came very close I think to to doing it and then it fell apart actually over debates over if i'm remembering correctly anyway over how it was going to be regulated and who was going to get what how both state was going to delve out licenses and who was going to get those licenses um which was a huge huge part of how pro when prohibition ended and and the sort of regulation um and i i think it's been very interesting to see pushback on um you know cbd oil and vaping in general um and the notions that uh 
wait a second, this this vaping thing, right, which is supposed to, on some level, look, well, it is supposed to be cooler than, especially when they add flavors in, um, right? It's it's different, it's cool, it's, um, or, well, we don't, well, actually, we, we do have some studies now that say that this is actually a pretty, not just great delivery system, but it, it does stuff to your lungs a lot faster. Um, there's also a lot of questions in particular with, with, and I've got a, a colleague at Butler who's who's working on vaping um, as a public health issue, and and the fact that while it's sort of regulated, it's not regulated at the same time, and it's nowhere near regulated to the point where you can be 100% certain that what you are purchasing is in fact um, what it says it is. And to me, that that brought has brought up a lot of. Uh, parallels to when you went and you bought bootleg liquor, were, were you actually getting what you thought you were, what the person told you that they were selling you or not? Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's not, we're not done. We're not out of that debate at all in the States. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about how uh, the pushback against vaping has gone something like this is a product that, that could be dangerous. Um, and there's, there's only one way to deal with it, which is prohibit, right? Like we've seen that even though vaping was initially, and that's the same thing that we saw with, with alcohol. It's right. It, it, there are these examples of it being bad, so get rid of it, right? Um, whereas vaping was often introduced because of those smoking laws, and it's not got a lot of evidence, the, the, the weight of evidence we had about yeah. tobacco smoking. Um, as, as to its danger, and yet it's being lumped in with that, and they're using the rhetoric that we saw in the liquor um, prohibition uh, issues. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a really good point. I, you know, and I, I think not to stray too far from alcohol here, but it was, <laughs> it's also interesting to see the rise of of marijuana and the debate over marijuana, in particular the smoking. <laughs> At the same time, we've essentially in the U.S. you know tobacco, um, no. You know, yeah. it, good luck finding some. You know, uh, yeah. um, even on, and I, I try not to do this mental math too often, but when I was an undergrad, um, <laughs> a lot of people smoked, and it was sort of the heyday of cigar aficionado, and that was the mm -hmm. cool, right? It was everybody was, oh, you wanted to smoke cigars, or you carried a lighter even if you didn't smoke because somebody might need a light. College campuses today, good luck. You know, finding anyone who at least openly is going to smoke. I, I don't even think we have an area left on campus where it's where you can smoke anymore. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's, this is all something, you know, it's not straying too far from alcohol because it's all something that John Burnham called the, that vice constellation, right? So you've got these different types of things, smoking, swearing, sexual impropriety, drinking, um, you know, drug taking, and they're, they all are sort of connected both socially like you would smoke and drink together or sexual impropriety and drinking or whatever and and they're also somehow morally connected right they're not just connected in the activities but they're seen as not a spectrum but almost like a i don't know like a yeah some kind of weird map of of different types of vices and how that how they connect it's almost like a whole bunch of intersecting circles or something right so so, so we do. That's why well, it's so fascinating. I think you've probably found this stuff fascinating as well, Jason, just the rhetoric around other types of pleasure products that aren't seen to have any other use except pleasure and the way people see these as problematic. And yet, what, what's the problem with pleasure? Well, you're the religious scholar or the scholar of religion, you tell us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh... The, in the U.S., the, the group that ends up sort of spearheading dry laws, and there are, there are others as well, but the one that becomes the most prominent is the Anti-Saloon League. Um, and the Anti-Saloon League is fascinating. Uh, Kay Austin Kerr wrote the definitive history of the league. Um, it's based in Ohio. It is very much an evangelical Protestant organization. Um, that being said, what they figured out was that all these things we're talking about, right? Um, people need something to focus on as, as a concrete enemy, right? You can talk about alcohol or drunkenness. Yeah, okay. 
but what does that mean? Who is that? Like, where's it? The saloon. The saloon, yeah. Um, right, and, and one of my favorite pieces of that rhetoric from the dry campaigns of the, the early 20th century was that the saloon is a cancerous tumor on the body politic. Yeah. And it's where all this stuff happens, right? Drinking happens there, um, obviously. Smoking happens there. Um, this is, you know, you get the anti-tobacco folks who, who call cigarettes uh, coffin nails, um, <laughs> right? Uh, you can buy cigars there in, well, actually you gamble for them. They're in slot machines. So it's like yeah. a two for one, you're gambling. And if you win, you get a cigar. Yeah. Um, Saloons will, some saloons anyway, will have what are known as wine rooms. And wine rooms are where ladies of the evening ply their trade because women drink wine. They don't drink hard liquor, right? That's very unladylike. And so if you went into an establishment and saw a woman drinking a glass of wine, chances are pretty good. She's, she, will, she will be there for, for um, some more carnal pleasure, uh, <laughs> perhaps, right? And so if we get rid of that, right, if we get rid of the solution, everything. all those other problems go away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's the theory, right? And it's it's a pretty powerful political argument that the anti-saloon makes. Um, and, it, and it helps ratchet up that, that move from sort of temperance moderation to let's just kill it. Yeah, and it's it, interesting, interesting how that happened. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, tell me if this was the same at the US, but what we saw, at least in Ontario, which is where I focus most of my um, attention, the, the temperance movement was all about public drinking and public drunkenness, so people being out on the street. And when that was sort of under control with tighter licensing, they went after something else. In Ontario, it was sales in shops that were connected to groceries. So they were worried that um, the uh, storekeepers would be giving women drink to make the, their purse strings looser, right? And that sort of thing. And then after that, they kind of got that under control. It was about the standalone saloon that wasn't connected to a hotel, right? And then once they got that under control, they went after um, uh, treating, right? Like, so buying rounds and stuff like that. So it was sort of uh, one piece after the other. And, and that's why I think it's interesting that the total suppression of the liquor traffic, which is our Dominion Alliance, um, had that broad issue, right? But but the, the, the Anti-Saloon League, which succeeded in achieving a national prohibition, really targeted their message more than, and than the other two uh, countries. So it, it's just, just, it's just really fascinating to me. Sorry, I'm thinking out loud, but yeah, yeah that's yeah. good. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. Um, so thinking about regulation, we actually have a question from the audience, um, Michael Adamson. Uh, he had, sort of has a couple of questions that are interrelated. Um, so he wants to know, how did Canadian distillers get paid by their distributors? And at what point did they cede control of their supply chain? So that's sort of the first question. And then he wants to know, how did Canada's tax authorities collect on revenue from smuggling operations? Uh, the, uh, there are two short answers. The answer to the first question is, I don't know. And I'm not going to pretend to go on <laughs> at length about it. Um, because I don't. Um, the second one was about collecting taxes. I'm pretty sure they, well, they they would get taxes from distillers distilling because it was legal to distill. And the stories are, they're sort of apocryphal, they're prob probably some true, is that they would then say they were shipping it out, say, to Cuba by a, a boat crossing the Detroit River. That's one of the fun gags. Um, the other one is heading to El um to uh, St. Pierre and Miquelon, which is a little island near Newfoundland, which is French, right, owned by the French. So, and I'm, I think a lot of that it went through that way. I'm not quite sure what happened on the West Coast. Um, so the taxes that were collected, I don't think there were ex exit taxes that they would be at the border um, giving up, would have been at the distilling point, and it wasn't illegal to distill, right? And there was a point in, I think, about 1920, 25 or 27 when or maybe earlier when the U.S. started complaining to Canada about all of this illegal liquor coming in and Canada did uh, restrict ex exports and that's where they had to have these lines like we're going to Cuba when they're taking a rowboat out in the um, Detroit River and stuff like that. 
So we also had a question from Jason Van Horn uh, asking, so in the US context, about county laws uh, that prohibit alcohol, whether they still exist, you know, if there are some that still exist from uh, the prohibition era. Uh, yes. Um, so when repeal happened, one of the ways that the, the federal government, the, the Roosevelt administration uh, really pushed it, and I, and I think it's, it, it bears in mind because it, it, it often gets sort of glanced over because we assume, oh, well, of course it's repeal, right? But repeal is a big deal for the New Deal um, at the start because it's a, it is, it's something everybody figured was going to happen once Roosevelt won. It's also a quick early victory. And so when you're thinking about momentum in terms of getting legislation passed, even when you've got super majorities essentially, or eventually in, in Congress, um, the way he, he did uh, getting something right and say, look, this is what we did. But he's, uh, the, the Roosevelt administration was also cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of people who are dries, uh, a lot of people who supported this law and a lot of people who Maybe even if they didn't support it, they support repeal, they're, they're in that sort of moderation camp. They don't want things to go back to the wide open saloon. And so they pass um, and, and make the argument that what they're really doing is they're, they're, they're getting rid of national prohibition. But if you at the state level want to do something, that's fine. Um, and so a lot of states revert back to local option in some way, shape or form. And so you still have well into the end of the 20th century. I think there are still some places that, that abide by this. I know my, this was a, a big debate in my grandparents' county down in Kentucky. Um, Estill County was a dry county my entire life growing up. And um, it was always very interesting because as you went towards my grandparents' house, as you were about to cross into that county, Boy, there were a lot of liquor stores right on the county line. Uh, the county was dry, um, but but uh, you know you could still go get it, um, and, and that's another you know part of of the prohibition story and then the repeal as well. It's not just something like home refrigeration, right? That that helps end prohibition, or even helps garner prohibition to begin with. It's transportation. It's a revolution in transportation. It's the advent of the automobile. It's interurban and public transportation in cities, which both, uh, it's a double-edged sword when you're thinking about dry laws, because on the one hand, it makes them almost impossible to enforce. Um, you know, if you're looking at a city and you say, well, this ward or this area of the city has gone dry, or we're going to regulate that there'll be no saloons or alcohol sales in this area, you can hop on, you know, a, a public trolley and go over to where they where it is, and nothing's stopping you from bringing it back. Um, same with a car. At the same time, that sort of transportation revolution is a driving force behind prohibition because, oh my God, I mean, people, do you want a drunk train driver? Look what happens, right? An accident. Drunk driving is something that's debated and discussed in the 1920s. Henry Ford is supposed to have said that uh, he wouldn't sell cars in a, in a place that didn't have some sort of dry law. Now, he's, of course, selling cars wherever he can sell cars, but it's <laughs> a good little quote, right? And uh, one of the uh, one person I interviewed who grew up during the dry years when I, I was working on my first book. Um, he said, you know, my dad always said a horse could find its way home if its owner was drunk, but a car <laughs> can't. And it's true. Yeah. yeah it's kind of hey, funny. I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to ask Jason a question because I'm, I'm not sure about this, but we're, uh, so here in, in, in Canada, our local option law was a national law that was applied um, county or city. Was that the same in the U.S. or was it counties passing their own laws or was it states creating a framework or how did that work? Yeah, so states would create a framework um, and it would be at the state level that would say counties can pass uh, some form of local option. And a lot of the, the way the trajectory, especially in, in my home state of Indiana, 
went was that was sort of the first, well, actually they, we tried in the, the late 19th century a statewide prohibition bill. I think it lasted for about a year and we got rid of it. But, um, but then it was local option. We're gonna let localities decide. And uh, so it was usually built under township ward. So townships um, within counties or wards within urban areas could, could go dry. And that, especially in the cities, often had to do with um, zoning laws. It was sort of one of the first steps in zoning. We're going to have residential here, right? And that means none of this right. can yeah. happen, right? Uh, um, sorry, yeah. I just want to interrupt. Yeah, go ahead. Just to, so if it was state by state, um, was this just selling laws or was this manufacturing laws as well? Like, was it local option, complete prohibition or? It's, it's, um, by and large, it's it's sale, okay. Um, and then which, you get, yeah, and then you get to the county level, which is sort of the next yeah. step, especially as Dries realize, well, wait a second, we it, it is a problem, right? That gets back yeah. to that transportation thing. Like it can still get in here, even yeah. if our little area says it's dry, it's still getting in. So how do we stop that? Well, if we, the whole county goes dry. Yeah, um, so that's the thing we saw with um with local option here is that the distillers and the brewers would just bring it in. And in fact, the distillers or brewers in a, in a county couldn't sell it in that county, but they could send it out, right? Or So it was, it was not too difficult. You didn't have to be too cagey to be able to get your product into a dry community. Yeah. And, you know, one thing we, we saw in Indiana, and this is maybe something else we can touch on is, and it certainly gets back to World War I, um, but in, so in Indiana, there's a, 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 a statewide county option bill is passed uh, in a special session of the Indiana State Legislature in 1916, or not, excuse me, before then, 1907, yeah, 1907, um, and 70 some odd of our 92 counties, I think it was maybe 73 or 74 of our counties went dry. The ones that didn't, large urban areas um, with breweries um, in particular, right? Um, and a lot of that has to do with, especially in Indiana at least, uh, German immigrants um, and German Americans and, and their sort of potent political pushback against that. And that's, you know, we, we started with discussion sort of on, on the era of World War I. Um, it could not come at a worse time if you were a wet. Um, once in the US case, you know, Germans are already suspect maybe because they're immigrants, maybe because they continue to speak German. Um, and then, oh, wait a minute, now we're fighting the Kaiser. And yeah. we've decided we're equating the Kaiser with the devil and um, Germans drink. Therefore, yep. yeah, we've got to, we've got to, this is hitting, right? This is your, this is how you can do your part for the war effort. Stop drinking. That'll just, yep. that'll, that'll give it to them. I looked up uh, just as you were talking and uh, supposedly according to at least this article I found, there are nine states that still have dry counties, mm. entire counties that are still dry. And in fact, three of the states are dry by default. The counties have to opt to be wet. Uh -huh. uh, so that's right. Kansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Mississippi was completely dry until actually fairly recently. I don't know, Jason, if you know the year. I remember looking it up and it was like <laughs> well past the end of prohibition. Oklahoma was the same way. Yeah. Um, they, they kept a, a statewide, essentially, prohibition law in place long after. Um, in Indiana, when repeal came, we got a very complex uh, system by which for, for distribution um, mm -hmm. that was very much tied to politics um, and, and uh, very much tied to our, our governor at the time, Paul McNutt. And um, as a form of political patronage and, um, and that distribution network stayed in place for a good chunk of the 20th century. And uh, I mean, we just, we just got rid of Sunday, a ban on Sunday alcohol sales about two years ago. 
three years ago. No, I don't know. I mean, with the pandemic, I don't count that year. So <laughs> um, we're a little bit off, but yeah. Yeah, my, my college when I was an undergrad, um, Boone County in North Carolina was, they, they called it a semi-dry county. And it was because they did have a liquor store, but it was like, had very small windows of opportunity to shop there. But none of the bars and restaurants could serve liquor. They could only serve beer and wine. And so if mm -hmm. students wanted to go out to the bars and stuff, they would go to the next county over, um, which is, I feel like way more dangerous. You're now you're <laughs> traveling an entire county while you're drunk. Um, so, um, you know, and, and at least when you were in Boone, they had tipsy taxi. So you had safe options, but if you're going a county over, you don't have that option. Um, and it took until 2011, I think, for them to actually end that and allow liquor licensing for bars and restaurants. Um, the student council ran a very good uh, ground roots operation to get students to vote um, because so many students would ignore the vote and town council was made up of a lot of older generations. And so, you know, year after year, the issue would come up, nothing changed until that grassroots campaign and the students were like, oh, you mean we can fix this? Mm -hmm. And so they did. It was, but yeah, 2011, I think it was crazy. Yeah, I think that, um, I, I don't know if we can all agree right now, but every state and province thinks they have the weirdest liquor laws. Um, I know in Ontario, people are like, what's, what the, what's the, and we do have some weird ones, but then I went down to Pennsylvania and if I wanted to buy craft beer, I could buy it in six packs, but not in this. And I was like, oh yeah, of course, it's just different everywhere. And it's all kind of weird. And it has this crazy, really interesting history, lots of patronage, lots of uh, moral arguments or whatever, whoever, whichever lobbying group was most powerful, that shapes the law and that becomes a policy legacy, right? For, it could be decades. Yeah, yeah I mean, when I moved, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Jamie. Uh, when we moved to Maryland, uh, it was one of those things where I came from an area where you could get beer and wine at the grocery store, but you had to go to a special store to get liquor. When we moved to Maryland, beer, wine, and liquor are all in the same store and they're not open on Sundays. And we were like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had a, we had a big debate uh, in Indiana with with the the changes and the the Sunday sales, because um, there was an argument uh, about whether or not alcohol could be refrigerated um, or not, and uh, the liquor law or the liquor stores, which traditionally you know will keep beer and and other things in coolers to go. Uh, were lined up against the grocery stores who said, no, 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 because we, we don't do that. We don't have that capacity in our stores and, and we'll lose out. So no, you, you're not going to be able to sell that stuff. Um, it's sort of, then, then you've got convenience stores attached to gas stations that sometimes will sell as well. And we had uh, one chain, I will not name them, but it's a, it's a big chain of a convenience store slash grocery or slash uh, gas stations who figured out that they could sell alcohol if they had a restaurant. Um, and so they were utilizing things like partnerships with Subway where they might already have a Subway as part of their, their gas station and be like, well, now you can go buy a beer with your, uh, your foot long sub. And then that that's that was one of the last they they thought they had a loophole. The state came in and was like, no, that's we're not going to let that. So that's that was one of the last steps before we we changed the Sunday sale law. Was like we can't like you're not a restaurant <laughs> the way we define restaurant. Yeah. Um, but that also gets to you know the in another time right a century ago that would have been another time where Dries would have said, see look. You know, we, we've got just a basic law here and you wets can't follow it because you want to make one more sale. <laughs> yeah, and at the same time, I, I know that in di different provinces and, and states, there were even different like weird little things that um, were based upon the perception of the regulator over what was better or worse. So for example, the one that comes to mind is whether a tavern had to have its windows wide open or shuttered 
right? In some communities, wide open meant the community can keep an eye on what's going on in there, right? In other communities, shuttered meant people aren't, I don't know, infected or whatever by what's going on inside, right? And it's, it's so that's another aspect of this fascinating nature is like who, who had the, the authority or who had the clout, but also how did they perceive these laws? Like what were they fixing, right? What was, what was going to, to be ameliorated by that, those blinds on the windows or not? And in Ontario, you had to cover your windows. All right, Jamie, should we do your, your favorite thing at the, the end of an episode and what we recommend? Yes. Um, so what we like to do at the end of the episode is have uh, each of us recommend something to the audience. It can be a book, a movie, a, a drink, um, whatever you think that our audience would be interested in. And not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to start with Jason. Well, uh, I would say that... and. My, oh boy, this is a tough one. Um, well, I'll go with drink uh, in honor of, of uh, and I will, I will do sort of two. One I would not recommend is uh, buttermilk, right? I drank, I drank lemonade tonight. Uh, we had, a vice, he was vice president of the United States, but before that he was Senator from Indiana, um, Charles Fairbanks, who was known as Buttermilk Charlie because he was dry, he was a good dry Methodist and he drank buttermilk, not alcohol. Um, I've tried buttermilk because I'm, you know, I wanted to get into the mind of my, my dry friends as I was writing about them. And I was like, this, there's a reason why nobody has buttermilk to drink anymore. I don't know how he did it. Um, so I would say my drink of choice when I drink, which, you know, it's not very often, but probably will be after we're done tonight is, is a nice little uh, glass of scotch. Um, unless it's my father-in-law and then he, he makes a very good Manhattan. Oh, damn, now I have to come up. Those are very good recommendations. And I think I'll just, no, I'm not gonna say what he said, but um, I, what I really like to, to think about is, and we've talked about this a few times, the way these substances, alcohol is, is the, issue, the topic here, but we went into others, is represented culturally in the, the, the different types of dangers. So I think about movies, right? Because that's where it has, it's, it's, it has, it's a tool, it's a prop, you know, alcohol, drugs. So I think about things like, so watch something like Requiem for a Dream, right? Which, which is, 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 there's a lot of production kind of issues, like your eye doesn't dilate the way it does in their, their quick shots, but and how addiction is represented, right? And then watch other things, especially these days, it's it, 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 the resurgence of spirits and in, in drinking and stuff like that. And just see how the alcohol, what the alcohol means in that shot. And it's not, this isn't kind of some kind of dorky, nerdy professor thing. It's actually really something that's easy once you're looking for it, right? You can see, what does it mean that that person drank that and what are they drinking? And why is that drink chosen right what does that say about the character and, and things like that so that's that's my recommendation it's a way a sort of a i guess a, a thought experiment as they like to say in current pedagogy so i'm going to recommend a tv show uh and of course my mom is in the audience and i've already introduced her and she loved it so uh it's a tv show out of new zealand called broken wood uh so it's a, a murder mystery. I love murder mystery shows anyway. Uh, and it's got really great uh, New Zealand accents. Uh, and being in New Zealand, they have great interaction with the Maori. And you know what, what does that interaction, that uh, tension look like? Um, and they also, the very second episode uh, takes place at a winery. So uh, connection to, to what we're talking about here. Uh, there's a murder, spoilers, murder at the winery. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the, the head detective uh, sort of owns a, a vineyard on the side. So uh, there's a lot of good wine culture going on uh, throughout the series as well. Very nice. Um, so I'm going to recommend a product. This is not sponsored at all. Um, but there's a company called Malicious Women Company which just speaks to my soul. And they do um, candles primarily, and they all have labels on them that are a little rude most of the time. Um, but I'm gonna recommend for those who want to like get work done and like really concentrate, their manifest that shit candle. 
<laughs> um, specifically, it says setting the intention and doing the work. But what I love about it most is that it is oak moss and amber scented. It is a perfect fall scent. So if you're into candles and fall scents and you want a little like, you know, pick me up, Malicious Women Candle Company. And Malicious Women Candle Company, if you're watching and you'd like to sponsor us, <laughs> we wouldn't say no. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this was a super fun discussion. Uh, thank you both so much for uh, for joining us uh, and for, for being such a wealth of knowledge about prohibition in the U.S. and Canada. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Jason, thank it's you. great to meet you on uh, Zoom. Uh, Dan, same. <laughs>